it was close enough that somebody nearby was going to get hit. It's like a big giant ant coming down and just ripping it all out. The roofs would go up and go down as they were struggling to stay attached. The glass broke in the living room and everything was flying. Cars were still spinning on their tops. There wasn't a tree standing. I just have time to come to a realization that, you know, we're going to die. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. The rural town of Siren, Wisconsin has seen a number of tornadoes over the years. But unlike the notorious Tornado Alley to the south and west, the twisters here are seldom deadly. They don't really cause a whole lot of damage as, as a rule. A shed of a chicken house goes off, a woodshed, something like that. So there's not really that great concern of, of devastation. All that changed on June 18th, 2001 when one tornado took Siren completely by surprise. Siren is located about 90 miles northeast of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and surrounded by some of the best hunting and fishing country in the Midwest. Like many of the town's 900 residents, Police Chief Dean Rowland and his wife Shelley rely on local tourism to boost their family income. I own a bed and breakfast, and so my wife and I had decided to get ready for the summer rush. I spent six hours that day mowing, trimming, making sure that everything looked good. It's a perfect day to be outside. Clear skies and temperatures in the upper 70s. But less than 100 miles away, across the Minnesota border, an ominous storm system is making its way east toward Siren. At 7.30 p.m., rotating winds swirl inside this supercell thunderstorm along a warm front, stretching across Minnesota and Wisconsin. As professional storm chasers look on, the air is sucked skyward and a twister is born. The tornado chews up the farmland below it and it begins moving east. A few minutes later, the funnel pulls back into the storm clouds and disappears behind a wall of rain and hail. Back in Siren, Police Chief Dean Rowland is at home paying bills. He hears a news report that dangerous weather is moving toward his town. They said that tornadoes had been sighted, oh, approximately 60 miles straight west of, uh, of Siren. Roland knows the town has no way to alert its residents that a twister may be approaching. Ironically, Siren's tornado siren has been broken for weeks. It had been knocked out of commission in a thunderstorm in April. I knew that no one was on duty in Siren. Uh, it was the other officer's day off and I was on vacation. Roland realizes it's up to him to warn the town. He gets dressed and heads out on patrol. Like a modern-day Paul Revere, he cruises through Siren, alerting residents. Still, he finds some people reluctant to heed his warning. And I remember even telling one person to take cover, and he says, oh, I'm going to stand out and watch it. I want to see it. Forty miles to the west, storm chasers are still tailing this supercell thunderstorm. At 8.06 p.m., ominous clouds release a second twister. Within seconds, the vortex evolves into a large, wedge-shaped tornado. It's growing, stretching nearly half a mile wide, and shows no signs of stopping. Near the center of town at the Poor House Tavern, 29-year-old bartender Chris Cormell is chatting with a regular, Clark Jewell. Clark and Chris hear Chief Dean Rowland's warning, but while watching the weather reports on the bar's TV, they find that they have something in common. They're both avid storm watchers. I had to go out and watch, see what was happening. We were standing in the parking lot, and the wind picked up, and you could see the, the wall clouds starting to come into town. The appearance of a wall-like mass of low-hanging clouds suggests that air is rising rapidly within the storm front. This circulating air is a sign of an approaching tornado. I was getting excited because I knew something was going to happen, and I've always wanted to see a tornado. In a small house just behind the bar, 
The Blaker family, Cindy, her 17-year-old daughter Naomi, and Naomi's stepfather Dick, are enjoying a quiet Monday evening. They haven't heard Chief Roland's warning, but Dick is watching the news. Naomi has gotten an unexpected rest from her summer job at Dairy Queen. My boss had called me and said, you know, it's a beautiful day, I have plenty of people to work. I really wanted to go out and enjoy it, but I was really tired. I dozed off on the couch after supper, and Naomi dozed off. You know, it was, school was out, we were all relaxed, no pressure. Their calm is going to be shattered. The half mile wide tornado is 15 minutes away, and it's cutting a path toward their home. Just after 8 p.m., Naomi is awakened in her bedroom by echoing thunder. I mean, it was banging. It sounded almost like jets. Boom, all of a sudden, my husband's waking me up. The weather looks bad. Get in the hallway. It takes Cindy a few moments to get up. She has a spinal cord disorder and uses a wheelchair. Besides, Cindy is not overly concerned until she reaches the hall. I was just thinking severe storms, and my ears popped. I, I remember thinking, this is not good. I've never had my ears pop in a storm. In fact, the air pressure is dropping rapidly, signaling the imminent arrival of a twister. Cindy heads to her daughter's bedroom. I reached behind me and slammed open her door. I said, Naomi, wake up and get in the hallway. The weather's bad. I just woken up. Panic thoughts were, you know, they're invading my mind. Boy, that girl never flew out of her bed so fast. And I said, grab onto the back of my wheelchair and don't let go. And she said, what's happening, Mom? And I said, I think we might have a tornado. The Blakers' home has no basement, and the narrow corridor offers little protection. Across town, Police Chief Dean Rowland has done his best to empty the streets. Now, he parks his cruiser on the outskirts of Siren and waits. I looked to the west and I saw what appeared to be a half mile wide fog bank coming. And I, I said to myself, wow, fog, that's really strange. Roland cannot actually see the approaching tornado. The rotating system is wrapped in a blanket of driving rain and hail. Suddenly the car is slammed by ferocious winds. The twister is almost on top of him. I could hear what sounded like a jet engine. Just a roar. And I looked and I said, that's, that's the tornado. I knew I was in trouble. The twister is now an F3, two notches from the top of the tornado scale. Winds are estimated at 200 miles an hour. Roland tries desperately to get out of the way. And I remember saying to God, don't let me die. My daughter's wedding was in three weeks, and I just said, don't let me die. I, I want to go to my daughter's wedding. Roland steps on the gas and drives to a lawnmower repair shop. He pulls beneath the building's overhang. A half mile away, Chris Cormell and Clark Jewell are standing in front of the poorhouse tavern, transfixed by the ominous sky. It was like purple and green, and then there was white. It was just, it was amazing. It was beautiful. I couldn't quit looking at it. In seconds, the tornado chews through a wooded area and rolls into a field directly across from the tavern. Chris and Clark realize they're staring down a twister. All of a sudden, it was just this rush, and I saw the trees were just picked up, like somebody just reached down and was plucking the trees out. They turn back to the poorhouse tavern and make a mad dash for cover. Other patrons are huddled in the bar's walk-in cooler. As the two men scramble through the bar, they're pelted with shattering glass and flying nails. I could see light coming in through the, through the ceilings where the roof was starting to tear and you could hear nails pulling, you could hear the wood cracking. We got, just got pounded, you know, debris flying everywhere and bottles and can. Clark is just a few steps ahead of Chris. He grabs the handle of the beer cooler's steel door. At that moment, the massive tornado slams into the bar. The building just went boom, like a major blast just blew it. And the roof lifted up, and the walls went out. I remember yelling to Chris, grab onto me. I reached down and clamped him on the waist. And just as I did that, the whole, whole roof went, and 
I just felt really light. He was actually floating in the air while he was hanging on to me. Then all at once, quiet descends. Both men look up and get a rare glimpse into the eye of the storm. It was the most vivid, bright, almost neon green that I could imagine. Clark even said something about how pretty it was. And then it came through again, and then that was it, and then it was ugly. It's the only time in my life I ever thought I was gonna die. Monday, June 18th, 2001, an F3 tornado has slammed Siren, Wisconsin ambushing the residents of this small town. Trapped inside the local tavern, Clark Jewell and Chris Cormell have watched the center of the tornado pass overhead. That's something, you know, so scary and could do so much damage, but it was just probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I realized that I was right in the middle of it, then the opposite side of the tornado hit again, and by that time I decided it was time to close my eyes and just hang on. Where it seems to me it was a couple minutes, it was only a couple seconds. And then it, it laid us down. It was like it just set me back down. The twister continues through the village, leaving the ravaged tavern in its wake. Less than 200 yards away, Dick Blaker, his wife Cindy, and her 17-year-old daughter Naomi are trapped in a narrow hallway in their home. Winds up to 200 miles an hour howl around them. It was a terrible thing, and the glass broke in the living room, and everything was flying. I could feel and hear, like, the front of the house kind of collapsing and falling down. And I remember just thinking, you know, oh my God, we're going to die. With incredible force, the tornado twists the house from its foundation, tossing the Blakers from their shelter. It lifted us up and then just kind of threw us back. There was boards and debris and house all over us and around us. All of a sudden we were laying down and you could see the back of the house. The terrified family is now buried six feet beneath the rubble. I was covered with the boards basically. I just had like a little bit of light to see outside. We just all kind of lay there in silence. On the outskirts of Siren, police chief Dean Rowland watches in horror as his town is ripped apart. I watched uh, buildings pulsate. The roofs would go up and go down as they were struggling to stay attached. There was no way to reason, logic, or control it. I was very scared, and then somewhere in this 33-second period, I looked out, I became extremely calm. The wind was, was still roaring. But there was a beauty, there was a, a glistening of, of colors and sparkly and shimmering, and there was a peace. Then the tornado moves east, leaving the village of Siren. Chief Roland quickly makes his way home to check on his wife Shelly. Luckily, his house is intact. Shelly is shaken, but unharmed. I parked in the middle of the road and ran to the back of my house where my wife met me at the top of the steps and we both said simultaneously we loved each other and uh, I was gone. Chief Roland knows his work is just beginning. He immediately gets back in his patrol car and heads for the center of town. There were cars hurled upside down, totally dented. You couldn't get through the road. Trees were sheared twisted and sheared right off at about 20 feet. It looked like a Hollywood production of a nuclear holocaust. That's where I, I called for help. And I said, uh, uh, send me ambulances, paramedics, police officers, firemen, National Guard. I need help. Siren's gone. 36-year-old firefighter Chris Cybers has also witnessed the destruction. He and other members of the town's fire department are already hard at work looking for the injured. As a fireman, there's things that go through your mind that it's going to be one long day, that there's going to be a lot of people hurt. As Cybers looks out over the devastated town, he can hardly believe his eyes. Cars were still spinning on their tops when we pulled up. There wasn't a tree standing in that whole area. 
Meanwhile, Chief Roland pulls up in front of what's left of the poorhouse tavern. A good section of the roof over the whole building was gone. I remember one woman coming to me, wrapped her arms around me, screaming, make it stop, make it stop, make it go away. Clark Jewell and Chris Cormell are among those who stagger out of the ruins of the tavern. Once I saw the bar, I thought that maybe I was going to walk across somebody that didn't make it. There was water standing in the street and vehicles upside down crashed up against each other. My car was sitting upside down against the building. Clark and Chris are not seriously hurt, but across the street, the Blaker family, Dick, Cindy, and 17-year-old Naomi are still trapped under the rubble that used to be their house. The front half of the house seemed like it was lifted up and dropped on the back half of the house. From beneath the wreckage, Cindy tries to comfort her imprisoned family. We couldn't move, so uh, we kind of held hands. And I asked everyone if they were all right. I'm, I'm the mom. I have to be strong in an emergency. Naomi was very frightened. Mom, are we going to die? Mom, are, are you sure? I had envisioned in my head that the tornado was going to turn around and come back for us. Because I thought, you know, its goal is to kill us. I almost was thinking it had a mind of its own. And I kept saying, no, Naomi, we're not going to die. Apparently, whatever I said was able to, to calm her enough that she got that surge of adrenaline. Somehow, 17-year-old Naomi forces her way out of the rubble. I didn't know really where they were laying. I knew they were near me. I was almost afraid because you know, I didn't want to step on them. As Naomi tries to get her bearings, she suddenly becomes aware of a new danger. We could start to smell gas. And um, my stepdad's 75 years old and he has somewhat of a heart problem. And so we knew, okay, he's probably not breathing too well. So I thought, okay, you know, they really need to get out of there. Leaving her mother and stepfather beneath the ruins, the frightened teenager climbs over debris and sets out on a desperate search for help. Oh, 8.30 p.m., June 18th, 2001. In the small town of Siren, Wisconsin, 17-year-old Naomi Nelson has just survived a terrifying F3 tornado. Her mother and stepfather lie entombed beneath the wreckage of their home. Naomi wanders through the devastated landscape looking for help. I just looked around and after all this loudness, after you know piercing our ears, all of a sudden it was like a deadly silence. And then I felt like I was the only one. Gradually, neighbors come out to survey the damage. Naomi tells them that her mother and stepfather are trapped. Within minutes, police chief Dean Rowland and fireman Chris Cybers are on the scene. It looked like all four walls had pretty much fallen on itself and the roof was gone. It was very difficult to try to figure out where they were. Gas is leaking somewhere in the wreckage. The rescuers will have to work quickly. Chris Cybers, along with the Blakers' neighbors, pull off the debris piece by piece. I could hear them inside yelling for help. I said, please don't leave us. And he said, I won't. And right there, that's such an emotional feeling. Um, you're trapped, and there's someone out there that says, I won't leave you. It takes the men several minutes to remove the debris. Finally, the Blakers are freed. Amazingly, they've suffered only minor cuts and bruises. In the end, the twister would travel more than 30 miles, which is unusual in this corner of the Midwest. Although there were no fatalities in Siren, other towns were not so fortunate. Two people were killed in northwest Wisconsin by the tornado. In Siren, the talk is of heroes. One of them is Clark Jewell, who kept Chris Cormell from being torn away by the tornado. You just do what's natural. Um, I wouldn't want to see anybody get blown blown away by a tornado. Cindy Blaker believes she owes her life to her daughter Naomi. She saved our lives and she's kind of modest. She said, no, no, I didn't. But she did. She got the help to come right away. I don't think I'm a hero. The heroes are the people that came to my house um, 
the days after and clean up my house. We would rebuild and the resolve of the people was just uplifting to me. Even though they lost much, they still had each other. If you live in an area that does not have tornado sirens, there are other signs that can warn you of an approaching twister. We'll tell you what to look for when Storm Stories returns. What type of weather may signal that a tornado could be on its way? A dark or green colored sky, a large dark low-lying cloud that appears to be rotating, large hail, a loud roar that sounds like a freight train. Remember that you cannot depend on seeing a funnel clouds or rain may block your view. Your best defense is to tune into your local TV and radio, especially a NOAA weather radio, to get the latest emergency information. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next.